good evening, and good morning, depending on which part of uh, the world you're joining us. Welcome to yet another webinar of regarding active reports. And today what we're going to do is cover active reports in a multi-tenant environment. So um, we're going to be looking at a bit about what multi-tenancy is all about, what is it, I mean, what does it mean in terms of an architecture, and then deep dive into the security provider and how that helps Active Report Server work with multi-tenant environments and look at three demos with the building a security provider, going through the code. I'm not going to actually do coding, and we're going to walk through the code, and if we have time, we'll also look at debugging the code and seeing the, the flow there. And then we're going to look at how multi-tenancy is implemented in the two different uh, designers um, and report types that we have. Um, we're going to focus on RDL reports and the semantic reports with data models. So those are the two, the three demos that we're going to get into. And at the end, we'll have a question and answer round. Before we get started, a few um, rules of engagement, so to say. Um, you have a questions panel in on the control panel. Feel free to enter your questions there. We can answer those questions while I'm in the discussion, so that will help keep things in context. The other thing is that we will be, we are recording this session, so we will have a recording published in case you miss something or you want to share it out with your uh, colleagues and all. We will have this recording published out uh, for you guys. Right, so without further ado, let's go ahead and move on to the session. Now, before we get started, let's uh, spend maybe Half a, set, half a minute or so on why Grape City. Um, if you're not aware of Grape City uh, in the, uh, and you haven't visited our website, Active Reports is an award-winning product, uh, flagship product for Grape City uh, regard when it comes to reporting and business intelligence. For the last 20 years, developers have been using Active Reports to integrate reporting and embed reporting within their applications, whether it's WinForms applications, web, web applications, or even all the way back to ActiveX and COM. Um, so we, from the developers, we always keep on getting information, and that's kind of what we use to guide our roadmap and um, look at market trends and everything. So um, this came. Um, Multi-tenancy is one of the key things that people are asking for these days, given the fact that there's a lot of SaaS-based products out there, a lot of web-based products, where a single instance of a product is really looking at multiple independent groups. So a lot of customers, what that means is a lot of customers are coming to the same product through a web application or maybe through uh, services um, to segregate or use the same server as their source for business logic and the business application. Um, an example may be a payroll system or an HR system or an ERP system even, if you have an on-demand version of those. Um, or it could be independent divisions of a large enterprise. So if you have geographically uh, disparate located uh, divisions like one in the US is accessing the same server, same application in a data center, and the guys in the UK are also doing the same. The key thing there is with multi-tenancy, you need to keep data secure, and access rights of the data are very important. So we'll, um, we'll look at how that impacts the architecture for multi-tenancy and which ones really work out. So there's three, um, at a very high level, there's three architecture modes for implementing um, and deploying multi-tenancy. The first one is isolated database. Now what that means is here we have our application as Active Report Server, but this could be, this would be your product. Um, and what that means in an isolated mode is that each customer has their own data store. Now this is a database in this case. Uh, but it could be a, a web service call or a data store 
in your uh, product, but essentially each data store is isolated, right? So each customer, you, your product needs to identify the customer, but once the customer is identified, the data, uh, the application knows which data store to go to. Um, in a shared database mode, which is the image down here, um, the customers are all going to the same data source, or the data store is the same, but it's shared. All the data being in the same table, you have filters on the rows. So the rows are filtered out so that only certain rows are available to certain users. So again, it is still important to authenticate and validate who the customer is and who the user is who's logging in. With the hybrid mode, there's two ways. You can either go to a schema level uh, isolation. So rather than whole databases, you um, separate out um, your single database into multiple schemas. Right? So each customer goes to a separate schema, but in the large scheme of things, you're still looking at the same database. Or you can do a combination where you have uh, maybe two customers going to one database and um, one customer going to another database. So you can have a combination of isolated as well as shared in your environment. So depending on what you have, let's go ahead and look at which one really fits into your uh, environment. So let's look, let's run a poll here. Let's, I'm going to launch this out. So let me know which environment or which mode of architecture of uh, multi-tenancy are you guys using? So I get a lot of people, well, it's actually now a 50-50 uh, distribution, it's changing. So um, most of us are on, most of us are on share database mode, so we'll move on here. I'm going to share with you the results here. So you can see most of us are on the share database mode. And um, that basically means it's either a um, schema-based separation or a row-based uh, separation. And we're going to uh, look at both aspects today. Um, now, before moving on, there's just one more poll here before we get on to the meat of things. How do you authenticate your users? So what do you use as your authentication mechanism? Is it Active Directory? Is it um, LDAP servers, is it other single sign-on tools, federated to security and stuff, or is, is it something that you have built yourself? Um, so I have, well, people are a mix of between, ooh, interesting. So a lot of people have uh, built the security themselves, so that's good. Um, okay, so I get 100%, at least they have a custom security module and some of them also have a mix of uh, Active Directory. So this is interesting. First time I got 100% on any one poll option, so that's good. Um, but And we're going to look at how today, we're going to look at how the custom security provider with Active Report Server helps with uh, um, setting up um, and integrating with either Active Report, Active Directory, or with the, um, your custom security module. So let me just close out these polls so I get more space here. Now, so what is the security provider all about? So the inactive report server, the security provider is essentially the layer between all access to data models and reports for the user. So when the user logs into active, Ser active report server, um, they'll go through the security provider. So um, the security provider will validate, authenticate, and pass on the user role information and the user context values. We'll come to what these user context values are in a sec. But the key things that it'll do is authenticate, validate the user, pass the roles, and pass in information about the user um, in the form of user context values stuff like tenant ID, customer ID, company ID, user ID, uh, and those are used in terms of permissions 
and filtering uh, and querying the data when it comes to the data models and reports. Now, um, whether the reports go to the single database or they go to a separate database here, that's something that will be determined based on how you configure the models. Uh, from a from a diagram perspective, we just kept the one server here. Um, right. So moving on, let's go ahead and start uh, give uh, a look at how secure how the security provider is set up and how you customize it. Right. So we're going to look at initializing the security provider, creating a security token, authenticating the user look at roles and look at how to provide additional user information. So let me go in here and open up my Visual Studio. Okay, cool. So um, before I get on to Visual Studio and look, we look at the code here, I'll increase the size here so we can see what's going on. Right? We're going to go in to the admin dashboard and let's look at how you configure a security provider and where it's all where all that configuration is. So in the administrative dashboard, um, in the under security provider, there's an option to choose what security provider, what type of security you want to implement on the server. Now whether it's something which is built in, which is managed by the security pages over here, users and roles, right? or if it's something that you want to integrate with an Active Directory um, that you have set up or an LDAP server that you have set up or all your other custom uh, security providers will be here. I'm choosing a custom security provider because that's what we're going to be demoing and working with. Um, Active Directory and LDAP are also provided out of the box for you guys. So people who are using Active Directory, um, this you don't need to code. You just can use and everything that's built in for you guys. Right. So um, connection strings are uh, in this case for the custom security provider. I have a connection string because that's where I'm getting all my data from. Right. So um, for testing, let's go ahead and test this. So when I send out a login and test, and I'm testing my provider, what it does is actually runs a security provider, and I get a list of user context information that uh, um, is provided. So the ones that we're going to be using a lot is my database name and my tenant ID. right? Um, and the other ones we're not going to use in this demo, but we're going to be using these two things. right? So um, and I, if I use user 2, we know the fact that this is working because it has different information coming up. Right? So this is where you would set up your security provider, but how do we get that in this drop-down? Um, it's easy enough to get it in the drop-down. All we need to do is drop uh, an assembly into the security provider folder here. There's my assembly there. Um, but now moving back to how we created that assembly, that's where Visual Studio comes in. Nice world of Visual Studio. Okay, so um, let's start off at the very, very beginning. Let's look at our um, initialization first. So increase that to 150 again. Right, so what we're doing here is, as part of initializing the security provider, um, we basically tell it what settings to show. Right, and in this class, all we're doing is basically saying, what are the different settings that we need to configure to um, make the security provider work. Now these may be um, web service calls or web service URLs or uh, API um, settings that you need to do. In my case, because I'm, everything is based off of the database, I'm just providing a connection string. That's pretty much it. You pass that connection string um, as a setting to when you're initializing the security provider and that will take us down here. Right? And we will basically set that connection string to the database class. So basically goes in and is ready to run queries on the database to find information like username, password, and authenticate for us there. So that's, a, that's about it for the initialization. You initialize it, you set it values, you um, have settings available there to use. 
so the next step is authenticating and validating the user. So here what we have here in the code, we're just basically getting the username and password. That's um, what we get when we uh, want to authenticate the user. So when the user signs in, he, uh, we're passing the username and password to the security provider and any custom information that you want to pass along with that. Right? And once we get that, we basically query, in this case, we're querying the database. Now this could be essentially a call to your uh, security module to validate whether this username and password is valid. If you already have a token that you're, you're passing through your application, um, it will probably come up in custom and you could send that out uh, to you again to validate whether it's a valid token in your security um, environment. But at the end of the day, in this case, we're getting a person object. In that object, we're saying create a token from that. And if that object is null, obviously, um, it's an invalid um, user. Right? The create token essentially is concatenating um, the values, um, the properties of this object, putting them into a string, and uh, um, hashing them so that it's not readable. But the key thing is it's able to take that back from the token. It's able to identify the person again, which is important for the validate and important for the other parts of um, the security provider. So here we're just validating whether from the token I can get the person object. If I can't, it's obviously uh, an invalid token. If uh, I can, well, it's a valid token. Then. Right? Um, we're not worried about the dispose. But that's essentially for authenticating and um, validating whether the person is um, authenticated on the server. The security token is the one that's used across the session to identify the user. And as you'll see, even when we're getting the roles, um, we're getting the person from the token. The token is all important here. Now, um, what we get when we're running the filter roles, what we get is a list of roles. Now, these are roles that are defined here in our list of roles on the admin dashboard in Active Report Server. So this list of roles is uh, used as an initialization for this list that gets passed through into our visuals, into our security provider. And what we're doing here is getting the list of roles from the person object, getting that list. And from that list, we're saying, um, give me a filtered list of the roles which map to the list of roles which are already available in, um, in the Active Report server list of roles. So that came in as a source here. So now with the target or the filtered list of roles, um, we basically pass through um, what, is, what are the roles that the user belongs to at the end of the day. So if we were working with Active Directory, for example, um, and we had um, the user belonging to five roles out of which only two are really present in or configured with Active Report Server, the subset of the two roles is what will be sent back to the server. Now, what that means on the server side is, in this case, user one is team alpha, so models and reports when we define permissions for models and reports, we're going to be looking at those models and reports which have permissions on Team Alpha. Right? So um, they will only be able to see those uh, reports, not all of them. And we'll see that when we come to uh, looking at the report list in the report model. Uh, sorry, the report portal. Okay, back to my Visual Studio. So that gives us a list of roles. The next, the third thing that uh, the security provider does is get us all the user context information. So the additional information that we need to identify and um, further uh, provide the uniqueness for the user. So we need to get more access details, stuff like user ID, in our case, the database name, the tenant ID, and that sort of stuff. So um, again, we get the person from the token. We need that object, right? And we get the user context keys, or you get, we get the user context values directly from the database. 
and um, we just create that user context. Now, behind the scenes, what this is doing is it's getting the user context keys, again, from the database, right, and uh, um, populating those and adding the values for each of these keys. So at the end of the day, we have a key value pair uh, object that we send out to the server, right? And that's what we saw here when we did the test run. So when we went over here on the user provider, on the security provider, we said user one, password, test provider, this is the key value pair. The first name, demo. Last name, user. Company name, Grape City. Server name, local, MS SQL 20, uh, 2012. Database, and so on and so forth. Right? The admin context function uh, in the met, uh, over here is basically just to provide a standard set of default values when we log in as the administrator in the admin dashboard. So the admin context is only used in the admin dashboard. It's not used anywhere else. And it's used to really validate the model um, when we're working with uh, model-based or the semantic reports and implementing multi-tenancy there, as we'll see in a second here. Right? So that's pretty much uh, it for our Visual Studio. What I'm going to do here is let me see if I can, it's not running in uh, um, admin, so let me see if I can do that. It will probably just want to restart. That's okay. This would be a good time to have any questions. We'll have a look at those, restart under different credentials. And what we're going to do is we're going to actually run the um, security provider in debug mode so we can actually walk through in that way as well. So I'll give it a second here. Security provider, that will keep it on the top level. And we're running an admin. Is it going to, does it remember? No, it doesn't. So let's go to attach process, show from all users. There we go, and attach. Attach. Okay, cool. So we will put a breakpoint here. Oh, okay, it won't be currently hit, maybe. We'll see, if uh, this doesn't work, we'll move on. Um, so let's go over here and go to security provider, refresh that. So we'll do user one. Test the provider, no, it didn't hit it. So the debug is not attaching correctly to the correct process. Okay, we'll leave this, we'll move on. Um, it really does go through just those um, methods the way that I explained them, so we should be good with that. Um, let's go back to our presentation and move on to our next demo. Our next demo, what we're going to be looking at is how multi-tenancy is implemented with semantic uh, reports using the data models. Uh, we're looking at both all three modes, the or actually two of the two of the modes, isolated mode and shared mode. The hybrid is essentially a combination of the two. So let's look at. Let's go back to our design, our report portal here, and go to our models. Okay, so uh, data models if the uh, we're not aware of Active Report Server. If you haven't heard of them, there they are essentially a semantic view over uh, a semantic layer between the reports and the database. So they define the structure in which which is used by the users to design reports. So um, what with multi-tenancy, 
the data models are our key, right? So they determine, we configure them so that they determine what is uh, um, what is available to the user or not. So they're the ones that are the key users for our user context. Um, in the first case, we're going to be looking at isolated mode. So in that connection string, I'm just going to go ahead and make this dynamic. Use placeholders user context dot database name, right? And what this does is instead of that fixed value, a static value, it's going to pick up the value from the user context database name. It's going to go ahead and validate that, um, whether that is a valid database, if it has the correct schema and everything for uh, my entities to work. It does, so we're ready to go, right? Save and publish. Actually, I should not save and publish right now. Let me show you first the raw output, right? User one, password, login. I skipped a step, right? So this is our user one, right? We have favorites, filtered customer list, and this is the list that basically gives me all my customers whether I'm in, um, whether I'm a specific tenant or not. Right now, we haven't configured the database or the data model in any way to filter uh, content, so it's actually giving me all. Um, it's going to give me all the customers. Right, so three-page report. Let's go back and modify that. Or actually, yeah, let's do. We'll modify. It. Right, so we'll publish this, and now when I publish it, this model, the updated model, is what's going to be used to run the report. Right, so over here, when I run this report again, as the same user, keep in mind, customer ABC here, right, without that uh, dynamic uh, uh, database name, and customer XYZ here, because the two databases that I'm using have different customer information, right? Now, if I log out of here and say user two, you'll notice here and here again, if I run the my filtered as the same report, I run this report here, it's going to give me the same output as the original because that's the database where user two has its data. Right, so that was the difference um, at the it, wrong place. That was the the difference. Well, I have it closed. Okay, we'll come back to it later. Um, that was the different database name. Right, ABC here for user two, and XYZ for user one. Right, so we'll close these again, and now what we'll do is. That's the isolated mode. Essentially, all you're doing is changing the database that uh, the data model uses to run the query based on the user who's logged in. Right now, I could also change the uh, the server name, user ID, or schema, um, and control the uh, the schema in that way. But we've only uh, looked at database name here. The other level is shared database. Right, so where you have a row level filtering. For row level filtering, you have security filters. So over here, what I'm doing is basically just adding an expression, support rep ID equals to my tenant ID. Right, there's my tenant ID. These are all the user context information that's being uh, that's made available from the security provider. So we're using just the tenant ID. We're going to call this. Um, support rep ID or support rep uh, condition, let's say, right? And apply that. And that basically is my um, security filter. So what it's doing is it, for the user, based on the tenant ID information of that user, um, the user context value, it's going to uh, filter and only show me those customers which have the same tenant ID. Now, if I wanted to further use this 
and um, have dependent data, dependent entities, for example, invoices, I can add an existing filter here from invoices right, and use the support rep filter to inherit that um, filtering from customer to my invoice as well. Right, so now I have filtered invoice data also so that the customer or the users only see uh, customers that they have access to and invoices that they have access to. Right, save and publish, again the same process to save it and publish it to the server and um, now if I run this it's going to give me a one page report. And the one page report is filtered based on my tenant ID. Right, here we go, one page report and if I log out and log in as user one, Okay, so I, uh, I was just looking at reports, sorry for the, for no sound or no speaking there. I was looking at the questions here and we'll address them um, a bit. I think I've addressed a few of them already in what I've been talking about, but we'll look at them uh, again in a sec here. So this is the uh, user one with the same report. So we have the same report being run, right? And that one gives me X, Y, Z. Again, one um, page filtered list and across different databases in this case because we have the dynamic connection string still in the model. Right, so this actually is implementing shared or in a way a mixed mode because I have a separate database and I'm doing row level filtering. So I could choose which one to use or use them both like I've done here. Right, so that's where, that's how I, oh, one more thing just to show you guys that I'm not cheating. It is the same report and I don't have any um, special filters or anything going on here. Um, we'll just open the report in design mode using the web-based report designer because that's what we use for semantic reports before we move on to the developer designer we'll use this and show the fact that we don't have any filters. Right, it's taking its sweet time to load. Here's that report, last name, first name, and no filters at all. Right? Cool. So, let's go ahead and close this out. Let's go back to my presentation. Right, so that was multi-tenancy with semantic reports using data models. Now let me take one second here, look uh, through the questions. Um, there's a question here about multi-tenancy data in a shared DB separated by row info like client ID. We did that in a way with tenant ID, right? Uh, instead of client ID, I used tenant ID in terms for the row level filtering. Um, does uh, the server just pass through user credentials to stored procs? We can pass through user credentials to the stored proc, but in, in case of the data model, what you're doing is really um, creating the query dynamically. So, so the server is determining what query to uh, generate dynamically and passing the user context information and the filter information uh, as a where clause. So if it were a um, a stored procedure call that you are doing, it would you can pass the user context information as a parameter to a stored procedure as well. Right? Um, the next question, so each client ID would get different data in the same report? Yes. So um, if you do set it up as filtered by client ID, um, the simple answer is yes. Um, each client will get the data that is relevant for them um, once you have your multi-tenancy configured. Okay, so let's move on. The next uh, um, thing that we're going to look at is 
RDL reports and page reports. How does multi-tenancy work there? So these are the more of the developer-based reports, so stuff that you would be doing, your developers or your guys would be doing, or you would use the end-user report designer to do the WinForm-based one. Um, you can pretty much do the same thing. Well, we're going to be looking at how to get the user context value, right? and how to use parameter data sets. This is what we're going to be demoing. We're very close uh, to the hour, so I don't want to spend too, uh, have a lot of time here. But um, the same content uh, is, or the same expressions are available uh, for property expressions, which you may want to do formatting on based on uh, the uh, user who's logged in, um, stuff like changing logos, um, setting the confidential, non-confidential, draft mode stuff, watermarks and stuff that you may have, or changing the databases. So we're going to be looking at only the shared mode uh, and also how to get the user context from the server. Right. So let's move back here to my demo and open up my report designer. Right, so. Okay, so we will address that question. There's somebody who's raised their hand, so let me see. So Paul, is that, uh, I guess you raised your hand for the question. Um, we will, um, I've, I've read the question, I'm gonna get, get to that in a second. Uh, let's let me go back to this and we'll address this question in a second here. Right. So back to this uh, back to this demo of uh, the end user report designer, um, the developer based one, the RDL reports. Um, RDL reports work the same way. We are using uh, um, Active Reports 10 here, so we have a different way than. Uh, what you would see if you would download the trial. Um, we are going to be releasing Active Report 10 in the next three weeks, or is it four? Three. Yeah, three. Um, so you'll be able to see this very soon. But we have server connectivity here, so we're essentially connecting the report designer to the server, so it saves and writes to the server. Um, and we're connecting as an admin. Right, so what we're going to do is we're going to build a report. So for data source, we'll just add a data source. It's a SQL Server connection. We'll do local backslash SQL2012 SA password, save my password, and use my active tunes DB. So it's, I'm going to use the same DB here. Um, press OK, and my data source is ready to go. Um, let me go ahead and add a data set, and this is what I want to um, parameterize here. Right? So this is, this is the key part of pushing that filter in there based on the user, um, based on the user context. Right? So we'll do a customer list, so we're going to do the same thing, the same type of report, and in the query, we're going to go ahead and say, uh, use that query designer have it build the query for us, right? Save that, and what that does is add the fields for us in here. So now we have all the fields, right? And we go back to the query, and we say, we add where dbo dot support rep ID, that's the field name for the tenant, right, is equal to code dot user context, that's where we're getting it, get value tenant ID. Keep in mind this is a case sensitive, so we will have to be careful about the cases that we use. Now this is an expression, it's no longer plain text, so I'm going to put it as an expression here. So that tenant ID is what we're getting over here from the security provider, 
let's go back to our security provider in the configuration test that oop, double clicked on it come on security provider back to my configuration and we say user one password test provider let me just make sure that I got the text right tenant ID so that's five tenant ID I capital D capital and I have it those signs the correct way I have it the correct way cool so we're good to go you press OK it's not going to validate because it's not running on server right now it's a local query um, but I have the custom the list so when I save this to the server it's going to use that user context to pick it pick up the value um, we're just going to do a simple table so we'll add a table we'll add last name first name company name add another field to the right add column to the right and add phone number okay. expand these a bit so we have more space Right, and we whoop. phone number. I think we need more space here for this. Okay, so we have first name, last name. Right, let's add a group as well, so like we had in the other report. Insert group, and the group we're going to base it on the tenant name. That's the name where company ABC or company XYZ. Um, this will be the same for both the users in our case because we're only implementing shared mode um, and it's the same database, but we'll do it just for the sake of similarity across the board. And I had blue colors there, so I'm going to use blue here as well. Uh, where's my blue? Let's do dodge blue. And let's do formatting of the background. Let's do a light azure color. And for my, oh, I forgot to make that bold. Sorry. That was bold. All of this is bold. And we'll do a background of games pro here. And we're ready to go. So I haven't added any filters or anything, any prompts. This is all built into the query itself. Now, when I'm ready with this, I do file, save to server. Right? I'm logged into the server already. As we saw here, right? And I'm gonna we already have RDL filter customer list. So I'm gonna do a filtered RDL report as my name. Right? Save that and it's going gone to the server. So now it's stored on the server. I go back to my server here, um, and when I log in here, there are no categories, obviously. Oh, it's not there. What did I miss? I missed giving security permissions. So in the roles or for those for that report that I created, I need to give security permissions. So where's my filtered already old report? Right here. I need to give the roles permissions to see them. Right? If I don't give the roles permissions, obviously they're not going to see them. That's what we saw over here. So I've given those permissions. Ready to go. Refresh this. This is user two, I think, or user one. It's going to get the that new report here. Right? And we'll run this. And while this is running, I'll go ahead and log out. Well, actually. I'll let it run. It may crash if I log out. So let me look at a one of these questions that's come up. Oh, obviously, because I forgot the customer over here. So I need to change the report. Oops. <laughs> I made a mistake. Found a bug. So in my query, nobody told me. I forgot my custom my table name. So dbo.customer.report ID. So we'll do OK. OK that. And file again save to server. And we'll overwrite that one. 
So we'll have a new version. Right? That's saved to the server. Go back to the server, close out on this. Look at my revisions. I have both of them. And we'll do the preview on the latest revision. Right? So now this is in the updated um, query, obviously. And I have the table name defined. Um, so while this loads, let's look at, oh, there. Uh, you got, this thing is not giving me a chance to look at the questions. Um, that's okay. So this is my customer ABC. The table is going, the database is the same, but my uh, list is going to be different. So this is user two. I'll log out, or I think that was user one. So user two. Log in as user two. Filtered RDL list. Preview that. And we'll see a completely different. This is this was user one, and this is user two. And the same report that I just created. This is my user two. Right? So same report, different users, different data, depending on what uh, data that they have at. Right. The key thing is getting uh, the query, and in the query, getting the user context using the syntax here. Right. Let's go back to my presentation. Okay, a lot of red marks there. Okay, so the takeaways. Uh, what we saw today was uh, we looked at the Active Report Server and how it implements the different uh, multi-tenant architectures, isolated mode and uh, shared mode and the hybrid um, modes, and how to extend the security provider to do that, whether it's using an Active, Repo Active Directory security provider, which is built in, or creating your own and using your own uh, custom security uh, module that you have implemented as part of your product. Now you can also pass through uh, the authentication so you don't need to go to that login screen every time and change your user ID and all. Um, you can pass through that and embed the report uh, portal as part of your product. So that's a different uh, webinar and that's one that we've already done so that's maybe something that we can look at um, when you have some free time. Other than that, multi-tenancy is supported across all uh, report designers, whether it's for semantic reports, page reports, RDL reports, or section reports. All of them do support that multi-tenancy um, architecture of using the uh, user context value to pick up um, information about the user. And obviously, the rest, the other things are standard stuff uh, with APIs. We've seen uh, some of the API, the call to the user context. Um, we saw the centralized server uh, execution, and um, it includes built-in um, features like scalability and scheduling. Again, that's a separate uh, discussion uh, and a separate overview session. So next steps. What we want, uh, what we request you to do we would like uh, all of you to actually start a trial and buy our product, obviously. Uh, but starting a trial is good. Uh, at the end of this session, we will have a you'll have a five question survey. Um, if you could just fill that up, it helps us understand whether the session was relevant. Did it answer your questions? Do you are there still questions still open or areas that you would like to de uh, do a deeper dive with? And we can set up separate sessions for that for you um, specifically. You can contact sales or support here. So um, we have a new um, form that you can fill up to um, submit your support queries. Or you can just mail um, information to sales and we'll, answer, we'll get back to you there. Or use any of the other methods that are is listed on our contact us page. Um, Twitter is good. Um, to contact us and to get and we'll get back to you on those. Um, but in terms of asking technical questions, 140 words is or 140 letters is not enough, right? Um, webcasts. We will have a uh, 
future webcasts listed up here. So for that, what uh, the release of Active Reports 10 will have a deeper dive into what's new future, uh, what new features of Active Reports 10 uh, as one of the upcoming webinars. So keep an eye out of that on that there. And we also will be publishing our recordings from past webinars here also. Right. So let's now spend the next five minutes before the hour is done. Let's look at some of the questions. So um, one of the questions is, I think this is the one that Paul, you were asking, how to always prevent cross-tenant viewing of data even in ha ad hoc. So when you build the um, query within, or when you update the data model, uh, it is always going to prevent that, uh, it's always going to base your information or the data from the user context information. It's not something that in an ad hoc environment your users will have the ability to change. Uh, as you saw in the report when I showed it to you, it had no filters. From a user perspective, they were not asking for filtering any data, but the model was filtering it behind the scenes. Let me know if that answers your questions or if there is any follow-up. Um, another question that we have from Chris, actually we have three from Chris, so let's see if we can do um, a few of them. Uh, is the web-based designer good at making pixel-perfect page reports that are very specific layout for different tenants, or the desktop designer is much better for that? It really depends on what you mean by pixel-perfect. Um, a lot of our customers are able to uh, get their stuff done with just the web-based report designer, um, and it is pixel perfect enough for them. But obviously, the desktop designer has more control over exactly on the page and the print uh, uh, layouts and everything that you need. Um, and I think the page reports are going to be more relevant for you there. Um, so, and if we we have, say, 250 different tenants, and we want certain reports to be available to all of them, but certain reports only to be available to one tenant, how easy is that to configure? It's role-based security, so uh, you would uh, give, you would share a role across all um, of your tenants for the custom or for the standard reports that you want to publish. Uh, and uh, have specific roles for individual tenants for those specific roles that you want to publish them. Um, so it's not a whole lot there to do. Would we have to put all 250 tenants into Active Report Server, or could the reports be available to specific? Uh, could the available report specific to some tenants also be shown or hidden programmatically by? using the same security provider. I'm not sure I understand this, Chris. Um, I will reread re this in a, uh, in a while, but I'll move on to the other questions first uh, and come back to this one. If you could explain this a bit more, it will help me. Um, so um, Kenny is asking, what will be limitations in terms of resources in the following cases? Multiple users running the same report or a specific report having a large data set. Um, so Active Report Server has built-in scalability, so it will run concurrent reports um, at the same time on the agents. Uh, the way that it works is each report is executed based on the context values. So each report is executed as a separate thread, uh, and it will maintain the context when it's showing it to uh, the user. So the security token and the user context are uh, instrumental in making that happen. Uh, so you should not have a problem with multiple users running the same report at the same time, um, or if one is uh, has a large data set and another one doesn't. The one, obviously, with the, a smaller data set will return sooner, uh, but the one with the large will not conflict or cause any problems with the shorter one, even if the shorter one is started after the case. Right? Um, so thanks, Paul, for confirming that that answered your question. Um, you do have another question, which is good. Um, can we configure and pass role definitions from our applications to AR server? 
Um, with the uh, Active Reports 10, uh, we are opening up the admin uh, API, so you will have a RESTful API that you can use to um, configure and uh, add roles um, to the admin dashboard. Right now, with Active Reports 9, you don't have that. Uh, with Active Reports 10, in three weeks' time, you will have it. Okay, so Chris, thanks for this clarification. Let me read this through. Um, can the roles be specified in the database or do they need to be configured in Active Report Server? Okay, so yes, now I understand what you mean. They do need to config, be configured in Active Report Server. Um, so when uh, Active Report Server has its own database that it maintains, and the reports that it saves or the report that it hosts need to be provided permissions or need to be given permissions for specific roles. And those roles will need to be in an Active Report Server. Um, the security provider, what it's doing is mapping the roles that you have within your authentication uh, or security module with the roles that are available with Active Report Server so that it can further identify what reports and models are available to those roles. So you will need to have them in uh, uh, both places, um, but like I mentioned for poll, you you do have uh, an API coming up which you can simply add roles to. So if you're looking at uh, addressing onboarding processes, um, you can do that um, through the API. Right, so I think we're right, right over. I think I got all the questions in, which is good. So, again, I want to thank you for joining, and I want to remind you to please fill up uh, the survey. It really helps us a lot in terms of figuring out what we want to do next, what you guys want to hear from us next, and whether this information that we shared today was relevant or not. Um, so, till next time, thank you for joining, and you guys have a good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on which part of the world you are in again. Um, and we'll all see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.